Action. Action. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, tonight, we have a special presenter for the main presentation. Uh, Professor Sally Lui is a member of the faculty at the University of Michigan, where she, which she joined in 2004. She is a professor of astronomy there. She obtained her PhD from the University of Arizona in 1995. That's my alma mater. And held prize postdoctoral fellowships at Cambridge University in the UK and the Space Telescope Science Institute in Baltimore, the home of the Hubble. Uh, she was also a staff astronomer at Lowell Observatory in Flagstaff, Arizona. Uwe is a recipient of the Annie Jump Cannon Award of the American Astronomical Society and a Career Award from the National Science Foundation. She is the lead organizer of the community advocacy group Michigan Dark Skies, a cause that we are all intimately bound up in and aware of. So she's going to talk to us about what we can do to improve the quality of our skies and, and you know how we can help in the fight. So without further ado, I give you Professor Sam. Unfortunately, um, and that is the fact that we uh, are changing our natural environment in ways that um, do not benefit the observing of the night sky. So, um, basically, in the days of our grandparents and great grandparents, the natural sky looked more or less something like this. And these are people that most of us have actually met, right? So, this is not a long time ago. <coughs> Maybe a hundred years ago, 150 years ago, something like that, the natural dark sky looked like this with the beautiful star studded sky and perhaps a little bit of other light that might be glowing from some other source, usually a natural source, also like fire or something like that in the distance. That contrasts greatly with what we have today for about 80% of the world's population. This is Metro Detroit. It is typical of what many people now live under, and it is completely unnatural. It's not what nature presented us with. And a lot of this light that we have now is light that is needed because we're more and more moving to a 24-7 society, and so we actually do need to illuminate our environment. Um, some of this light is even beautiful. But a lot of this light is not needed, and not beautiful, and not even used by anybody. And so that is, by definition, light pollution. Light pollution is light that is not doing anything that anybody wants it to be doing. It is not performing any function or task. And because light is literally a form of energy, that means it is literally wasted energy. You can see this image right here from the International Space Station looking down on our region of the globe and you can see all of this light that's glowing, coming off from the cities and it's going straight up into the night sky where it is not serving anybody. That light was designed or meant to be illuminating the ground where people are doing their activities and instead it's going right up into the sky and not helping anybody except maybe some people who are in airplanes. And we all know that pilot spectrum do not need to see these cities in order to know where they're going. So it's actually not helping anybody. It is wasted energy, and the International Dark Sky Association, which is the advocacy group for dark skies, estimates that the amount of energy wasted corresponds to about three million cars worth of carbon emissions which corresponds to about three billion dollars a year in wasted uh, money corresponding to that wasted energy. So it really is a huge problem financially as well as in terms of the carbon emissions of our environment. <clears throat> Not only that, but this problem is growing exponentially. This is from a study published back in 2001 
And it's showing you how the night sky is basically changing in its brightness over certain areas of the United States, starting in the 1950s, and then moving to the 1970s, and then 1997, right before this study was published. And over here we have a projection for what it was expected to be in 2025. And we're pretty much on schedule for that kind of light pollution, unfortunately. So you can see the problem is burgeoning exponentially. And soon we will be in a situation where there will be almost no natural dark sky. And I should mention, uh, the, what you're seeing here is in the red are regions where this natural sky brightness is enhanced by a factor of 10 to 30. So that's a very large amount. It's an order of magnitude. Right here is the light pollution map for the state of Michigan. And this is already data that's a little bit old. This is from 2015, as you can see. So it's already gotten a little bit worse than that. Um, and there's a couple things to take away from here. Again, the regions that, are, that you see in red are regions that are about 10 to 30 times brighter night sky than what is natural. But we do see that even in the lower peninsula of Michigan, there are some regions that have some natural, pristine, dark sky, as you can see on this map. And there's much more in the UP. So our state is one of the only states east of the Mississippi that actually has some areas of natural dark sky. And so we are in a position to try to preserve some of this here in Michigan. Another thing to note is that the light polluting source city pollutes an area that is much larger than the area of that city. So take Ann Arbor, where I'm from. You can see it down in the corner over here. So Ann Arbor um, is polluting a size that's about 10 times the size of Ann Arbor. So the stakeholder cities are not just the ones that are being affected by the problem they create, but the surrounding communities are also stakeholders in this problem. So what are the types of light pollution? Well, there's three basic types. The first one is light trespass. With light trespass is simply light falling where it is not intended or needed. And the classic example of that is when you have your neighbor with their floodlight that is shining right into your bedroom window at night. So everybody knows that problem. Uh, it is light falling where it is not intended or needed, and it does have unintended consequences, including your relationships with your neighbor. And also there's a lot of light going into the environment, once again, that is undesirable. Another type of light pollution is glare. Again, something that we're very familiar with. I experienced glare when I was driving here tonight. This image, for example, down here has so much glare in it that you can't see what it is, but it is basically a car driving in the night and somebody else's headlights are coming in so that you can't see very well. So glare is when you have a lot of contrast in brightness so that it actually impairs your vision. It reduces the visibility. It also destroys your eyes' adaptation to the dark, and it exacerbates clutter and confusion. And clutter and confusion is when you have a variety of different sources, they're very bright, and it makes it hard for you to kind of navigate and see what's going on. Again, something that I experienced driving tonight in an unfamiliar neighborhood. And then the third type of light pollution is the one that you are all quite familiar with, Sky glow, it is the brightening of the night sky due to light that is scattered up from the ground. And this reduces the visibility of the stars and the galaxies, the things that we would ordinarily see from space. And it also creates an abnormally bright night, which affects us biologically. That means the night sky is not its natural brightness. And that, once again, has great consequences for the environment and for our health. So this is the view that you might see if you were in one of the national parks out west. And many of these parks now are being designated as International Dark Sky Parks, which is really, really wonderful, thanks to the International Dark Sky Association once again. But if you were in one of those parks, you might see this. You see here the constellation of Orion on its side, familiar to us all, and many, many stars in the sky. Now. How many stars would we see in a typical semi-urban environment? We might see only something like this. 
So how many stars have we lost in this scenario? Now we're basically looking only down to about third magnitude in this image right here. And that corresponds to a loss of tens of thousands of stars. In fact, at third magnitude, you can basically only see about 150 stars in the sky. So that is basically uh, a huge loss to our entire perception of the night sky. <clears throat> and the stars, through the ages, have really been our connection, not just to the current state of the universe, but even a connection to our own history, the development of human knowledge over time. We have always wondered where we are, what it is that's out there, what those stars are, and that has basically been the first science. And so we, we have seen the constellations, for example, which are the oldest form of human knowledge that has been artificially constructed that is still in its current state as it was 5,000 years ago, essentially. So here we see the constellation Cygnus. Cygnus is always a swan with its wings outstretched. We always see Taurus as a charging half bull, the front half of the bull. We always see Pegasus, the winged horse, as being the front half of the winged horse. We always see Orion in this kind of pose with the club overhead and the sword at his side. Those images, those depictions of those constellation figures, for many of these constellations, are exactly of the same form as they were 5,000 years ago. So that is older than our alphabet. Our alphabet that we use was invented by the Romans a mere 2,000 years ago, right? It's older than the Arabic numerals that we use as well. It's older than anything that I can think of that is actually used in exactly the same form that we have today. So the constellations are our connection to our own past, our own construction of human knowledge. And today, we still use the stars to try to understand the, the universe. Now, using the latest modern technology from both the ground and from space, this here is the field of the Kepler Space Telescope, which is uh, the, the, the NASA satellite <coughs> searching for exoplanets and so forth. So astronomy is now a completely different thing. It is now a modern science that we use to understand the universe. So what would it mean if we were not able to see the stars? What would it mean if children could not look up at the stars and wonder? We would have a very, very myopic view of the universe, and one that I would be very concerned about uh, in terms of even trying to preserve scientific inquisitiveness, being curious about the natural world, being curious about the way things are out there and what's happening out there, and just trying to make a connection with the natural world in a quantitative, scientific way. If we don't maintain that curiosity, then we risk basically not squandering our opportunity, perhaps, to even go to the stars, which offer us the future of, of humanity as well. But here in Michigan, we also have our dark sky heritage. Here we see a fantastic image by Brandon Reek, a professional photographer. This is taken on the shores of Lake Superior where you can see both the Milky Way and you can see the Aurora Borealis, the northern lights here. Both of these phenomena are things that you have to have dark skies for. And not only do we see them both here in Michigan, we can see them against the spectacular backdrop of the Great Lakes. So it turns out that the dark skies of Michigan and the ability to see the aurora are one of our greatest dark sky heritages that I hope we can do something to preserve. In particular, Michigan is the best place in the world to see the aurora, something that is not well advertised and perhaps we could try to better promote here in the state. When people look at pictures of the aurora, they're often taken from Scandinavia, from Iceland, or from Alaska, and so forth. These places are much farther north. And so invariably, these pictures are often taken in the winter, and people think that you have to be in the winter to see the aurora, and nothing could be farther from the truth. In fact, what's happening is the aurora is caused by particles of the solar wind that are smashing into the Earth's atmosphere, and they are funneled in along the magnetic field lines of the Earth's magnetic field. And so the, they come in centered on the Earth's magnetic pole. So this is the geomagnetic pole right here in red. And you can see that it is 
in our side of the globe from the white cross, which is the geographic pole, the rotation axis of the Earth. And so since the geomagnetic pole is in our direction, that means that we are essentially the farthest south area in the world to see the aurora. So why is that such a great thing? Well, basically, if you think about what happens to the nighttime in the summer, when you're very far north, you might have an idea that might make it hard to see the aurora. Does that make sense to people? If you go to a very far place, if, if you go far north, in the middle of the summer, you end up in the land of the midnight sun, right? And so there's basically no nighttime, and so you can't see the aurora at night. But we are far enough south that we actually have a normal night, and so when the aurora happens to come around, we might actually be lucky enough to see it during the summer, and we can get these spectacular shots of the aurora with the Great Lakes, as I mentioned. So Michigan is one of the best places, is the best place in the world, I would argue, to see the aurora. Again, a great heritage that I think we should work very hard to try to protect. So dark skies are also an environmental issue. I've alluded a couple times to the fact that it's not natural to have a light polluted sky. And so biologists call this artificial light at night. It's a non-judgmental term, Allen. So Allen interferes with wildlife migration, mating, feeding, and sleep, which is pretty much everything that wildlife do. Animals and plants live by the 24-hour cycle of day and night, and that this basically gets disrupted by artificial lights. Humans are also a type of animal, and so we also can have our biological cycles disrupted. And it was just a couple years ago that the Nobel Prize in Medicine was awarded for work done in discoveries related to the circadian rhythms, the cycle of night and, and day that humans also <coughs> um, fall under. So with birds, birds are one of the species that are especially affected by by light pollution. Right now, it's the fall migration season for the birds, and here in the Great Lakes area, again, we are on the bird migration highway. Many of these songbirds migrate at night, and the number one cause for bird death is slamming into buildings. And birds get very confused when they see all these artificial lights, where really they're only expecting to see just the moon and the stars. And so birds end up slamming into buildings and dying, and it's believed that up to a billion birds are killed annually, which is a staggering number. And I just read last week that they think something like a quarter of all the birds in North America have basically died out. Um, I don't mean species, but that the, there are a quarter fewer birds now than there were 50 years ago. And a lot of this has to do with slamming into these buildings. So the Royal Ontario Museum annually puts on this display here of birds that have died around the Toronto area. And then up in the upper left corner here, we see the bird kill from one building in Ypsilanti and one day during the migration season as well. And so in this area, there are people, who uh, um, organizations that do work to try to mitigate these effects. And here are some of them, the Washtenaw Safe Passage in Washtenaw County, Safe Passage Great Lakes of the Audubon uh, Society of Detroit, the Fatal Light Awareness Program in Toronto, and then in Chicago they also have a lights out program during the migration season. <coughs> there are also other species of animals that are affected. Sea turtles are another famous example in Florida. When baby sea turtles hatch, they hatch on the beach, and they are biologically programmed to find their way to the sea, where they must go right away, and they're programmed to follow the glinting of the waves. Well, if they happen to instead see the glinting of the city lights, then they will head off in the wrong direction, and they won't make it to the sea, and so they die. And so this is a problem that is becoming better known in Florida, and so this graphic that I'm showing you here is from a public service announcement. Um, but that's another example of a species that is being strongly affected by light pollution. And then we also have a lot of other species that are active at night, in particular nocturnal pollinators of crops and other economically important 
plants. Mm -hmm. um, things like, for example, the lesser long-nosed bat up here, which is the pollinator of the tequila agave. And so that is, again, an economically important <coughs> species. Um, when also we have many other insects and fish, including salmon, um, etc. So birds, bats, sea turtles, insects, fish, many, many species that are active at night. And then I mentioned again, ourselves, we are a species also. And the American Medical Association has also made some strong statements about light pollution. The ASA in 2012 said that many species, including humans, need darkness to survive and thrive. So there are a couple different ways in which human health is affected by light pollution. In one instance, we have glare, as I mentioned before. Glare is basically just a safety issue when you're out on the road at night, or even not on the road. It will impact your night vision, and therefore it puts you in a dangerous situation. And then the other issue is the sleep patterns. So if you've got uh, an unnaturally bright sky, or you've got light trespass, it will affect your sleeping at night, and that is a problem because it affects your melatonin production. And melatonin turns out to be a very important hormone that has been linked to cancer, diabetes, cardiovascular disease, and obesity, according to the American <coughs> Medical Association. Again, if you have chronic sleep disruption, you might be subject to risk for these kinds of conditions. <coughs> and then the AMA has also specified especially that blue light can be harmful to your eyes if you have it in too much and too high doses. Mm. Now the American Astronomical Society has also put out a resolution on light pollution in 2017 where they have called on communities to adhere to dark sky principles, in particular full cutoff shielding, meaning that no light should escape above a horizontal plane. All light should basically be pointed downwards. They are also recommending that uh, blue light should be controlled and we should try to go toward redder wavelengths for similar reasons. And then to try to control the levels of light, not lighting more than what is needed. So as I mentioned, we do need to have lights on at night and we're not advocating for everybody to turn off all their lights. It's, it can be the, a situation where we can have our cake and eat it too. So what is the purpose of outdoor lighting? Well, we want to provide a safe environment at night. We want lights to extend the use of parks, walkways, and other areas. We want lights to enhance landmark features. And we want lights to enhance travel and safety. I think everybody agrees that we need to have lighting for those purposes. In addition to that, we want to enhance visibility and not impede it because you may remember glare is a kind of lighting that does not enhance visibility. We want lighting to contribute to a nightscape and not dominate it. We do not want glare, we do not want light trespass, and ideally, outdoor lighting should have a master plan. And here we have a very nice uh, image of a plaza that shows evidence of having a thoughtful master plan. So we can see that most of the lighting here is quite mellow, but it is well lit. People can see where they're going. It's fairly uniformly lit also. And we can see that most of this plaza is lit from above so that there's no light heading up into the sky. Even the banister on the stairway, as you can see, is lit from above. The other thing is that you can't see, since we're standing at a somewhat higher level looking down on the plaza, you can't see the lights that are actually illuminating the plaza. They must be at the tops of these poles here, and yet we can't see them. So here's a light pole, here's a light pole, and there's another light pole. And so these light poles must be fully, the lights at the top of the poles must be fully shielded so that we can't see them. So that's very well done. Also in the periphery, you can see it looks pretty dark, so that means the light trespass is well controlled, um, and the fountain looks beautiful. So altogether, a very nicely planned, dark sky friendly, non-light polluting plaza. Here is another example. Um, we want outdoor lighting to provide a safe, secure environment. 
We want safe routes for traffic, cyclists, and pedestrians, and we want to facilitate the extended use of outdoor spaces. So we see tennis courts here. These are from uh, the U of M tennis courts. And again here, this is not too bad, right? The tennis courts are very well lit, perhaps maybe slightly overlit, but nonetheless, they are, they are well lit. And again, we don't see the lights that are actually illuminating those tennis courts. They must be at the top of some of these poles here. And in fact, I think I can point them out there. So you can see they're well shielded. We don't actually see the lights that are illuminating those courts. And the courts are in use. Right? So people are using them, and so the lights are functioning for their, for their uh, recreation. The lights that are causing more of a problem are these globe lights right here, here, and around. So you can see the clutter and confusion that I learned, alluded to earlier. So those are the lights that are more of a problem in this scene right here. In fact, if you imagine that you're a bird with a bird-sized brain trying to navigate through this scene, it would be pretty difficult. So safety. Many people are concerned, rightly so, about safety. <coughs> there is one thing to keep in mind, and that is that more light is not necessarily a safer situation. So what we need is smart lighting, not more lighting. Over-illumination causes shadows, Shadows is where people and bad actors can hide. Glare reduces visibility, as we said. It also reduces your eye <coughs> vision when you have over-illumination. And also, you can illuminate targets to make it easier for people to become the targets of cr criminal activity. So here's an example. This is a scene where we can see a person standing there on a walkway in a very highly lit situation. This is a perfect example of where more light is not making this person more safe. A lot of this light is illuminating the trees up here, which isn't helping anybody, and it's probably not appreciated by the squirrels and birds. And we see this person standing right there, pretty well illuminated. And if we now look at the scene again, the person is actually still in this image. Even though this is a supposedly very well lit scenario. So can anybody see where the person has moved to now? The left over on the right. I think it's left. On the left. On the left. On the right. The person could be in either one of these positions. Could be on the left or on the right. Oh, yeah. yeah, so the person is right here, right? Yeah, so that person is very well hidden in the shadows now. So we really haven't helped this scenario very much. So that's one example. Another example, we've talked several times about glare, how glare reduces visibility. So here we see uh, another scene at the wall of a house and a doorway perhaps, and you can see a very, very bright light there. That bright light is supposed to help illuminate this situation. If you were to shield the light, you could see much, much better. You could see that there's actually a person standing in the doorway. And yet the glare in the image on the left pre prevents you from seeing that person very clearly at all. Same thing on the bottom. There you have your floodlight, there you have your open gate, but you really can't see if there's anybody there. If you shield that light, this person becomes much more visible. So again, we see that glare is actually impeding visibility and not helping. And then we have so-called stage lighting here. So here we have a bank with a drive-up ATM, and it's very, very well lit. Does that mean that you're super safe? Well, maybe, maybe not. Somebody could be waiting in the shadows and looking, and with binoculars, they could probably see exactly how much money you were taking out there because you're so well lit. Lighting helps everybody. It helps the good guys, and it helps the bad guys. 
And so there have been many, many studies, dozens of studies over decades that have basically concluded, well, found no conclusive, conclusive link between crime and lighting. There are some studies that show a correlation between crime and lighting, and there are some studies that show an anti-correlation between crime and lighting. So there is no clear consensus whatsoever on this topic. And this is just to give you an illustration of some of the dozens of studies that exist on this topic. Perhaps the most famous one is a famous anti-correlation. This was the Chicago Alley Study, where basically in Chicago, they were having some trouble with crime in some dark alleys, and so the police decided that they would just illuminate all of these alleys and see if that helped reduce crime. And so they had data, statistics, for how much crime was taking place before the alleys were lit, and then they did the study again afterwards, where they, they continued keeping their statistics for crime. And so what we have here is how much it changed before versus how much it changed after they put in the lights, basically. So 0% change is this, this line right here. And so these are different types of crimes. So on the left side, we see violent offenses. And we see that during the day, the violent offenses went down. So daytime is red. So zero is here, so this is negative. So during the day, violent offenses went down after the lights are installed in the alleys, and violent offenses went up at night because they had lit up the alleys and made it easier for people to see and conduct their criminal activity. And then here we have, uh, these are property offenses, so things like graffiti really, really went up. In fact, it even went up during the day in that case. Um, and then this is everything else. And then on the right hand side is the total. So basically all the crimes went up at night when they lit up the alleys. Now this is just for this one study, right, at this, at this one location. So I don't know what the circumstances in more detail were, but it's another example of how lighting doesn't necessarily help prevent crime. It certainly does make people feel safer, but it does not necessarily mean that people are safer. Now the good news about trying to combat light pollution is that the solutions are easy. All we need to do is on this one slide. We need to light only what is needed, light no more than needed, light only when needed, and light no bluer than needing. And that is all we need to do. If we were just to follow these steps, the problem would go away, and it would just go away instantly. It's not like having toxic waste dump in your backyard where it will take decades or radioactive nuclear waste, right? That stuff lasts forever. Once you turn off the lights, the problem is gone. So that is the really, really good and hopeful thing. It's just a matter of educating people, raising awareness. So what can we do? We can use full cutoff shielding which means simply having light that does not emit above the horizontal plane. All light should basically be pointed downward. We should use timers, dimmers, and motion sensors so that the lights are only used when we need it. We should use light that is warm white, so kind of more toward the redder, yellower hue of white light rather than bluer light. And it would be very helpful to enact lighting ordinances and other regulations to help people remember to do these things and raise awareness. That's really the name of the game. So light should be fully shielded. Here is a graphic that shows you that all of the stuff in orange here is wasted light that is not helping anybody and it's only annoying the neighbors. And using up much more energy, a 500 watt light bulb. Whereas on the bottom, we're using only 100 watt, watt light bulb and making everybody happy. So it is functioning, it's doing what it's illuminating ground as desired and it's not causing any extra uh, unwanted light. Here we see um, more examples of different degrees of shading, and we've got the worst over here, and then bad, better, and best. Um, I just want to stress that the bad over here is almost as bad as the worst case scenario. So why is that? This light that goes up at upward angles is almost as bad as light that goes straight up. In fact, it's worse, and the only reason why 
why this one is worse is because it has the upward, the obliquely upward <coughs> light as well as the stuff that's going upward. So the reason why the stuff going up at this angle is so bad is because it's scattering through a lot more air. So you can see here that light going straight up will basically scatter through a much thinner layer of air than if it goes up at an angle, right? It's going to have many more opportunities to bounce around and come back down as light pollution as it's going at an angle rather than up. So the stuff that goes straight up basically goes out and it doesn't come back as light pollution. It's still wasted energy, but it doesn't cause sky glow, whereas the stuff going up at an angle does. The other thing is that um, blue light, once again, is not only intrinsically more of a problem for things like night vision and so forth, as the AMA mentioned, but blue light scatters much, much more strongly than red light, and it goes as wavelength Many of you know that wavelength is represented by lambda. It goes as lambda to the minus four. And so that's why, for example, the sky looks blue. It's because all of that blue light is scattering so much more than all the other colors. So that's another reason to really try to cut down on the blue light. Now, that applies if the scattering particles are tiny. So basically air. If, on the other hand, you've got larger particles like fog or dust, then those, then this uh, that length of the minus four doesn't apply and it basically goes directly with the wavelength. But in a situation like that, when you have fog or smoke or something, in that case you have so much scattering happening that basically everything that you're doing is causing light pollution or sky glow. Another thing to geek out here is that brightness is exponential. So what, what I have here is a table on the right-hand side that shows you sky brightness for different kinds of conditions. So for example, we can see here that a full moon sky is 100 times fainter than a twilight sky right here. So full moon is 100 times fainter than twilight, and starlight is 100 times fainter than full moon. So it's 10,000 times fainter than twilight, right? So what that means is it's not enough to say, oh, my lamp fixture eliminates 90% of uplight, because that's only a factor of 10, right? So if you're only decreasing a factor of 10, then you're only going from twilight to deep twilight. You're not even getting to quarter moon or starlight. So that's meant, again, to emphasize that full cutoff fueling is really essential to try to eliminate all uplight, if at all possible, because this is an exponential problem in the sky brightness. Again, the solutions are easy, which is the great news. It's not even expensive. These are lights that I installed on my own home. They were only $39 a piece. So, as it turns out, the lighting industry is very familiar with the whole dark sky concept. And you can literally do a Google search on light fixture dark sky, which is what I did here. And you can come up with all kinds of dark sky friendly designs in any kind of style for any kind of budget. So it's not a hard problem. Having these overhead canopies are fully shielded, but there's a movement now, apparently, with these service stations that, uh, for some reason, want to illuminate underneath the canopy as bright as day. And not just as bright as day, but as bright as noon, for some reason. <laughs> uh, so this does not necessarily help anybody either. So it's just plain too bright. And as you know very well, it takes your eyes 15 to 20 minutes to fully recover your dark adaption. So there's no reason why service stations need to be that bright. It's perfectly fine to be able to see here. And again, we need to just work with our own biology. Our eyes have the capability to see further into uh, the night if we would just allow our eyes to do their thing. So back to the blue light. I mentioned that blue light scatters far more strongly than red light, about 10 times more strongly, depending on what wavelength comparison you're doing. Blue light also cause more, causes more disability glare and vision problems, especially for people who have cataracts and other eye problems. 
blue light scatters more, and it, that means it scatters more inside your eye as well. Blue light also destroys your night vision more quickly, as I mentioned. And so, again, that's a reason to try to avoid blue light, and that's why astronomers, as you know, all walk around with red flashlights, as, as you do. Even the American Medical Association, again, put out a statement in 2016 saying it's estimated that white LED lamps have five times greater impact on circadian sleep rhythms than conventional street lamps. So the AMA is all over this as well. In the industry parlance, they say the color temperature rather than the color. It's a way of quantifying what color you're talking about. They recommend the color temperature should be less than 3,000 degrees Kelvin. What does that mean? Well, it basically corresponds to a thermal spectrum. So a thermal spectrum uh, uh, is specified by the temperature of the thermal spectrum. So what we see on the top here is a 7,000 degree thermal spectrum, and you can see that most of the light comes out in blue wavelengths compared to a 4,500 degree thermal spectrum where most of the light comes out in redder wavelengths, like this, for example. So the recommendation for color temperature is 3,000 degrees or less, which means warmer color temperatures. At least we call that warmer, um, but of course it, it's, it's actually a, a, a lower temperature, just to be confusing. Uh, but anyway, that's the way that uh, people in the lighting industry quantify color, and so we want to stay with a very cool color temperature, something that's 3,000 degrees Kelvin or less. Okay, so we were very excited about LEDs coming on the market because they are so energy efficient. Everybody wants to save energy, right? The question is, will we actually save energy? So there is this phenomenon called the Jevons Paradox, which has been known since 1865, and that is that if the price of energy goes down, people will simply use more energy rather than save energy. And here I've plotted an illustration that applies directly to lighting. This is from a study published on lighting in the UK. And what we're plotting in the dotted line is the price of lighting over the period from the year 1700 to 2000, so three centuries of lighting. And you can see the price of lighting has really gone down a lot. And during the same period, we also see the consumption of energy for lighting in the black line over the same period. And we basically see that it does exactly the opposite that the price of lighting does. This is a classic example of the Jevons paradox. Instead of saving money and saving energy, we just light more, we use more energy. And so for that reason, legislation is absolutely imperative to realize conservation of energy and lighting. And I think we all have seen anecdotal examples in the last couple of years where lighting at night has just ballooned because of cheap LEDs. This is an issue that people in Michigan actually care about. So when Ford Field put out their purple lights at night, 1,200 people signed a petition within the next few weeks saying that they didn't want that. Similarly, front page news in the Detroit Free Press in 2017, a beautiful article about dark skies and light pollution. I highly recommend it. It's on our website. And then right here in Michigan, as you know, we are part of one of the largest communities of amateur astronomers in the U.S. And this organization, along with other clubs, forms the Great Lakes Association of Astronomy Clubs that has something like 20 some different organ sub-organizations, if I understand. So that's phenomenal. We have a really huge community right here in Michigan that uh, is very interested in astronomy and interested in being able to see the skies. Moreover, many of you know that Michigan is also home up north to the Headlands International Dark Sky Park. This was the sixth park ever designated by the International Dark Sky Association as a dark sky park. It's near Mackinac City and Emmett County Park. And this park was founded not by astronomers, but by local citizens who simply valued the night sky. And it won the State of Michigan Pure Award in 2017, as well as the 2017 Best Dark Sky Place of the International Dark Sky Association. 
Moreover, the state of Michigan itself, Department of Natural Resources, has specified six state parks as dark sky reserves. This is very unusual, especially for a state east of the Mississippi, that the state itself has specified dark sky reserves. And so these are the six uh, state parks in this graphic from the Free Press. And uh, I think we can be very proud of our state for recognizing dark skies as an important natural resource. Many communities do have lighting regulations. This is just a set of the <coughs> ones that I know, but there are many more that I'm not aware of. Um, Side Township, Wright Township, Emmett County, the state of Michigan dark sky reserves that I just mentioned. We have the Safe Passage Great Lake states, which are for the bird migrations, so people turn off the lights. Um, there's a, this was supported by a resolution in Ann Arbor and also by the state of Michigan in 2012. And then our group in Ann Arbor was launched a couple years ago. It's called Michigan Dark Skies, and it's a community coalition of several different interested parties. It's based at the U of M Astronomy Department, but we also are working directly with many members uh, who, who are affiliated with all of these other organizations, the Amateur Astronomy Club in Ann Arbor, the U of M Student Astronomical Society, EMU Physics and Astronomy, Washington State Safe Passage, and Detroit Audubon, which are both bird advocacy groups, and the Huron Valley Sierra Club. And this is our website. I've also brought cards from our group that you can take away with our website on it. And in Ann Arbor, we are working hard right now on a couple of different fronts. One of the things that we have achieved recently is for Ann Arbor to revisit these pedestrian globe lights that are all over the city. Um, and we have uh, basically persuaded them to use a model that has a light blocking plate at the equator so that they no longer have so much uplight going up. They're still keeping the globes, but you know, basically modifying them, retrofitting them with these light blocking plates. They're reducing the wattage some, and then also for their new lights that they're installing, they have the 3,000 degree color temperature cutoff, so they're a mellower color. And we've also developed a draft lighting ordinance in Ann Arbor that has these elements to it. Again, the warm color temperature to be specified for all new construction, no light trespass at the property line, fixtures fully shielded, curfew, and brightness limits on facade, canopy, and parking lot lighting. One thing that we really would like to have is amortization of existing lights, but that seems to not be something that, um, unfortunately, is in the draft right now. Uh, it's something that we're still trying to sort out if there's a way to do this, um, but uh, right now that is the one thing on our wish list. We're working with the Energy Commission in Ann Arbor, which is really the sponsoring party uh, for this draft, and also members of the Planning Commission have been uh, working on our team together with our, our organization and the International Dark Sky Association has also been directly involved. So they've been very, very helpful. There are a lot of jurisdictions, and especially in Ann Arbor, but this may apply to other places in Michigan as well. The lighting ordinance draft that I just mentioned will only apply to private property. That includes businesses, but it does not include things like street lights and public rights of way. So for those, we need to do something separate. And so that's what we're working on now, is to try to make recommendations for the city policy that will affect city street lights <coughs> and other public rights of way. And then, as you probably are also aware, educational institutions, meaning the University of Michigan, which owns about, I believe, 30% of the street lights in Ann Arbor, uh, the University of Michigan and the public schools are exempt from all of these regulations, and so that's a completely separate effort uh, that we have only just started. And the, the right now there's a President's Commission on Carbon Neutrality Initiative at U of M, so we're trying to plug into that, but it's going to be a long haul there as well. And it's an urgent problem because there's always new things happening. Uh, as I mentioned, you know, the cheapness of lights, now you see entire buildings covered with Christmas lights. So uh, that's an example right there uh, from Ann Arbor. And now we have all of this happening on the bell tower on the Newham campus. I saw this uh, driving around town recently. So people are getting more and more creative in their ways to, to pollute the night sky, unfortunately. And that's again where education is needed 
interested and some kind of regulations would be very helpful. This is a slide from the International Dark Sky Association where they have offered some ways of breaking down uh, how regulations can be set up at the city and county level here. Uh, lighting codes, some cities work with lighting zones, areas where they're gonna say, okay, this is a commercial district, this is lighting zone one, this is a, 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 a residential district, this is lighting zone two, and so forth. We've not quite done that in Ann Arbor. We think we can use existing zones, um, but lighting zones are a very common way of dealing with lighting uh, uh, regulations. And then uh, at the state level, there are also things that can be done, standards for state-owned from the facilities and permitting, roadway lighting, et cetera. And then energy efficiency norms and regulatory mandates at the national level. And manufacturing standards are something that perhaps we could think about here because we have the auto industry and auto headlights, again, are another one of those kinds of topics that are very relevant to Michigan. I want to mention that the Illumination, Illuminating Engineering Society of North America and the Federal Highway Administration also do have their recommendations, and the IES in particular, their lighting handbook has guide rights for lighting levels and illumination for every possible thing you could think of. It's a very comprehensive book, um, but these recommendations are very largely ignored just because, I guess, you know, they're, they're meant for lighting professionals and most of us don't hire lighting professionals for just, you know, lamps that we buy around the house. Um, but these standards do exist, and if we were just to pay closer attention to the lighting professionals, we would actually go a long way to uh, combating unwanted <coughs> and poorly designed lights. There are even the, this, this program here, which is sort of like nutrition information labels on food. Every light has this uh, lighting facts uh, <coughs> document that exists for it. And so, I don't actually know if every single line has this, but this is an industry standard here. And so, you can get data on how much energy it produces, what its color temperature is, and so forth. Okay, so basically, uh, the good news is that we can do something about this if we were only to light only what is needed, no more than needed, when it is needed, and no bluer than needed. This would allow us to save energy, improve safety, improve health, restore the natural environment and habitat, and reconnect with the night sky. This is something that we can all help out with. There are many ways that we can do this and that you can help us to share this information. This is our website once again. I brought some pamphlets and brochures also um, to help spread the word. You can review lighting at your own home and modify as needed. You can talk to your neighbors. You can support dark sky friendly legislation and support dark sky places. Visit the headlands, tell them how great they are. Um, you can join the International Dark Sky Association, which is a nonprofit, and they are basically the only group that really, really does do all of this work to promote and awareness around dark sky issues. They have only a shoestring budget with a very small staff of under 10 people, and they are a phenomenal organization. Um, you can join our email list as well. Um, and I have, again, more cards like this from the International Dark Sky Association to help you remember uh, these easy <coughs> to implement points on your own. Thank you very much. I live in a, in a condo place that all the lights down the road are the globes. If you put the if you put those lights with a shield at the top, do you cut down the light or are you still using the same energy to light that entire bulb? Yeah, you can use a lower wattage, sure. Lower um, wattage. The, the um, plates in this particular model of globe are installed, the, so the manufacturer is aware that globes you know, can yeah, globes have a lot of uplight. So this particular manufacturer, and there are many different manufacturers of globe lights, but the one that I'm referring to in Ann Arbor does have a, a retrofit that they supply to people who want it. It goes at the equator of the globe, and it does mean that you can reduce the wattage because 
You're That's now right. reflecting a whole bunch of and the who life. who do I talk to to get to our condo plex people? Another well, then I don't know. But I'm saying, sure. is there Probably somebody that will give them the information? If I'm a tenant, hell with you, they go. But if, but if I've got some other resource that can come and talk to them about that, how do I do that? Um, so I guess you'd want to find out who is in charge, first of all. Well, I know that already. Okay, so, so if you know who's in charge, if they're interested in saving money, which they can by reducing the wattage, mm -hmm. then you could provide them with this information. That's what I'll do. Okay, thank you. Yeah. And the International Dark Sky Association, once again, has a wealth of information. Isn't Tucson a uh, light uh, preserving place? Yes, yes, so Tucson was a pioneer. Right. Tucson was probably the first dark sky. Well, actually, I think Flagstaff may have been the first dark sky city. But Tucson's certainly the first dark sky city of its size. Yeah. Well, in the 1970s, the, the bug light in Broglio was a big political deal in San Diego. Mm. Uh, to protect uh, Mount Palomar. Oh, right. Okay. And they were called bug lights by the detractors because they were so dim and, and oh, cold. And, and, right. So uh, I don't know whether Tucson or San Diego was on that beachhead first, but it might have been about simultaneous. Okay, yeah, good to know, good to know. I know the IDA was founded in Tucson. Oh, that, isn't it still headquartered in Tucson? They're still headquartered. <clears throat> I recall a statistic about Tucson that uh, the International Dark Sky Association was helpful in, in uh, protecting Kitt Peaks uh, yeah. and that the, the lighting, uh, as I recall, in 2000 or 2015 was at the same level as it was in 1960. Uh, That's because of the efforts yeah. in mm -hmm. Tucson. Yeah, they have done an amazing job. And Tucson, it, 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 it's a big city, but the citizens understand that astronomy you is very on, important you... to their economy. And so it's, it's something that a lot of people in Tucson know about and they buy into. And you it's climb... a perfect example where you know public awareness has mm -hmm. gone a long way. You climb a mountain outside of Tucson? You can see Phoenix better than you can in Tucson. That's right. Well, yeah. <laughs> yes. Our, our car headlights are really like they're, they just don't, the LED. It's the car seems so piercing. Are they really blue? You know. Um. Well, the whiter, quote unquote, the whiter it looks, that means it tends to have a lot more bluer light in it. And some of these car headlights. And my car has it too. Our halogen lights, actually. So some of them are LEDs and some of them are other technology, but if they have that really, really white look to them, regardless of what technology they have, it means they have more blue spectrum light. Yeah, yeah they just more efficient or cheaper, or why do they use it? They make people <laughs> think that they illuminate better. <laughs> they blind, they glare. They do, they're blind. More, more glare. Yeah, more glare. What does uh, amortization mean? Oh, I'm sorry. Amortization means um, that you want to. Uh, so, so if you have if you have lights that are non-compliant now, and then you pass the lighting ordinance, <coughs> amortization means how are you going to deal with the old stuff getting into compliance? If you don't account for amortization at all, then it means they never have to come into compliance. It means you don't have any amortization. So it just means you know moving the trying to get the non-compliant stuff into compliance. How are you How are you going to deal with stuff that was already non-compliant and now? Yeah, but if the old bulbs burn out, then you just replace them with the same. They're allowed to do that under the under the reg. Yeah. That sounds a fairly generic uh, architecture. Yeah, that, that's that a really well long way Exactly. <clears throat> that really illustrates the problem. There is a problem with what you're saying though. When we first went out west, we went out to Arches National Park and we looked up at night. It was hard for me to find the North Star because there were so many stars that I'd never seen before. <laughs> That's just <laughs> terrible. <laughs> Go back to Central Park. <laughs> yes. So how did you, so as somebody who knows 
knows some people on my city council and has, has talked to them on a number of occasions. How did you start having a constructive dialogue with the city? Because most cities have so much going on that this is low on their ranks of, of concerns. And a lot of people just feel better if everything is lit up all the time, even when they're asleep. And it's really hard to get past that emotional feeling that people have that more light is better. And it really is almost just one of these unexamined things that causes us to have golf courses for lawns across the whole country. Just There's no real reason for it. It's just part of the culture. And it's really hard to change. So yeah. how, did, how have you had success with with city leaders? Yeah, you're exactly right. And thanks for asking that. So I feel like I've been incredibly lucky. Um, I didn't know anything about how the city worked or how these things got started and so forth. And I just kind of fell into the right connection somehow. So um, what happened was we started this little group. And, and, and actually, the, the way this group started was because I was teaching this course out at Kipi in Arizona. And I had the IDA guy come and, and talk to my class and so forth. And we came back to U of M. And, and then we saw something in M Live about how U of M, about how Ann Arbor was going to build more globe lights, you know. And since we were all fired up from that course, you know, the students and I said, ah, you know. And so then we wrote this letter to the city council, and they did uh, someone from the public services sector of the staff wrote back. So we were engaged. So once that happened, we were engaged. And then I was like, okay, now what? So then someone in our group said, you should talk to so-and-so and so-and-so and, -so and gave me a couple names. And these turned out to be people on the Environment Commission and the Energy Commission. So I gave a little pitch like this, not a full-length one, just like a 15, 20-minute pitch with some of the same slides here to the Environment Commission. And they said, oh, yeah, you know, we've seen this before, and, and we're really sympathetic. This is really great. But they didn't do anything, right? But they were sympathetic. They were supportive, right? So, so at least we had that. They faked that well. <laughs> OK. And then, we, and then I gave the same pitch to the Energy Commission. And for some reason, the Energy Commission was really interested. And one of the Energy Commissioners, with the support of the chair of the Energy Commission, said, let's do something about it. Let's write a light in ordinance. And so we started talking. We started getting all the model lighting ordinances from the International Public Sky Association. And we found another great website from Pennsylvania, which I can also forward to you, which is for smaller communities. And we started basically just pulling together all the different ordinances we could get our hands on and try to develop something that had the best of all of them, essentially. So we have a model now that I think works very well for a city of our size. I'm willing to share it and so forth. Hey, can we borrow your slides? Sure, yes. <laughs> um, and yes, you can. And, and then uh, the planning commissioner then said, okay, you know, we need more help with this. So the International Dark Sky Association also started helping us. We had Mary Stewart Adams, who was the person who was behind the headlands, also on our team. Um, and so we had some people who were pretty credible, right? Um, we had an energy commissioner we had, and, and, then he, and then he said, well, we need to get this to the planning commission. So then I made the same pitch to the planning commission, and we said, we need your help. You know, this is obviously a planning commission kind of thing. Will any of you help us? And two people from the planning commission volunteered right then and there at our meeting. So we had two planning commissioners who then also helped us, and, and that was the team that really developed the nitty gritty for this. So I would say, you know, suss out and see who's on these commissions because the commissions is the key piece. We initially were like, let's ask the city to develop this, right? They don't have time. The staff people are totally overworked. So we had to do it ourselves. But we did it through the commissions. Um, so I, I, I somehow, you know, because Ann Arbor is a very green place, we had sympathetic people. I also talked to a couple city council members who were also sympathetic, but again, we're kind of like, yeah, you can do this, you know, we'll support it when it finally comes to council kind of thing. Um, but I agree, you need, to have, you need to have some people who are actually willing to do the grunt work on the commissions. So that sounds, sounds like Ann Arbor's leading the way. 
Yeah, well, I, I think we are because we are the I think we are the only city of our size to have a draft ordinance that is, you know, in this kind of suburban environment. I mean, there's a couple of cities in Minnesota that have ordinances that are they're not quite as big as Ann Arbor, so they're they're approaching that, but. Um, yeah, I, I think we're in a pretty good position right now. So, the school? The school? U of M. Yeah, so U of M, that's a completely separate thing. Um, that, and we still have a lot of work to do. Yes, so we have a, we were, it's great that we're leading the way on the ordinance, but that's only part of the, part of the effort. All right, we're yeah. going to have to call it. Right. One last question. Okay. Uh, we, we have a question in the front here. Yeah, not you, Jonathan. I worked for 36 years on the electric company in California, in San Francisco. And for the first 12 years, I was an electrical engineer. I was actually one of my responsibilities in this is. And we found that the best resource to get these things adapted is to get people to pressure the government and the right. businesses. And we went to the Sierra Club, Audubon Society, uh, get groups of kids who are very environmentally aware and have them pressure the the city, whatever. In San Francisco actually did quite a bit of stuff. It's still like it was far better than it used to be. Also, the company will go through lights. Like DTD, I'm sure it's the same way. They will put in, you know, change out the street lights in the down facing different color temperature bulbs, yeah. etc. And so it's, if you think you can just go to a company, you know, like a company and say, please don't do this, they're just going to say, okay, <laughs> lip service, right? Right. But if you get them to the back organs, it's like Tucson did. Yeah. yeah, thanks so much for mentioning that. I think one of the reasons why we got traction also was because we said we're a coalition, right? We had all these organizations. And especially if you can get your environmental people on board, they are, you know, they're already organized. The Sierra Club, they're very influential. They have a lot of members. If you can say that the Sierra Club is working with you, then people start paying attention. Um, and so I think that's very important. And then the other thing also is that DTE will come and fix the street light that's flooding your house if you call them. So will they? They will. Yeah. Yes. They will. What? So <laughs> yes. Twenty years I've had light. Like. And now he's moving. Call them up. No. Call them up tomorrow. All right. Thanks Let's so thank much. our speaker.